Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final session of the Cases or Crisis, Equipping Sterile Processing and Surgery to Succeed in ASC Beyond Clean Virtual Events. I am so excited to introduce our final speaker for the day. She's headlining the tour today. Uh, her name is Dr. Weva Truscott. She's currently president of Truscott MedSci Associates LLC, a medical science consulting company focusing on infection prevention, on educational course development, lecturing, authoring articles, and preparing regulatory submissions. Dr. Truscott is an internationally requested speaker and an author having presented in 18 countries, authored over 90 articles and six book chapters. Holy cow. <laughs> we are so happy that she's here today. We love Weba and we're excited to hear her presentation today on acing the inspection mm -hmm. and improving patient quality of life. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Weba. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As we go into our, our talk, you're going to see a lot of words and they're very important words, uh, but it also can be overwhelming. At the end of the talk, I will put everything on a PDF handout so that you'll have the data to be able to, or the uh, information to be able to use as we go into inspections in our various facilities. So today's title is really SPD, but it is acing the inspection and improving patient quality of life. And every day, think about this. It's not bad for a day's work, right? What an awesome responsibility what an awesome opportunity, what an awesome contribution to healthcare. As we get into our talk, I have nothing commercially related to the contents of this presentation to declare. And, oh, and I, like to, I like to add a little bit of humor to the talks because it helps me to keep that energy level up. So an inspection, not fun, but internal and regulatory inspections are musts. And so the response may be, but I'm so tired of being told what to do. Our place is shiny. It's new looking. It's great. Why do we have to have an inspection? Inspectors are just pencil pushers who can't do what we do. What do we need them for anyway? Well, you're right. They often cannot do what you do, but they know the rules and they want to make sure that those rules are here to you because they are protecting the patient. I want to first of all give you an example of some of those inspections, uh, what has uh, happened, and bring that to heart. Say, I don't want that to happen to my place. In 2003, and I won't continue to say the dates, but they had 42 surprise inspections uh, by the uh, uh, Joint Commission and found that fewer than half of the facilities had adequate sterilization standards. So they had nothing to look at to be the, up, up to the standard they should be. Las Vegas had 50,000 former patients were notified that they may have been contaminated with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. And the same thing basically happened in Vancouver where it was 500 former patients with those same uh, viruses. And on the right, just, just to remember how, how crucial this is, up on the, uh, the, uh, the most... Um, the hepatitis liver that you can see a healthy liver compared to cirrhosis caused in this case by hepatitis C. Um, it, it, and if the person is also a drinker, of course, how, how severe that can be. Inspections who exposed weak areas such as unannounced inspections in 2009, multiple hospitals found that 57% of the time they did not comply with SOPs for reprocessing that they had written, that they did not comply to them anymore. In many cases, they just changed their procedure, and it might be a good thing to have changed, but they didn't record it in the, a new SOP or an altered SOP, which caused them to be written up. Uh, so that is one of those hints we need to be able to do when, whenever we're changing our procedures. They've not pr properly trained to clean and dirty endoscopes, and 50% had no recorded task training generally. Training is an integral part of sterile processing or anywhere in the ASC. Unannounced inspections of 2009 multiple hospitals, whoops, I'm sorry, uh, among the deficiencies that were listed in a, uh, after, inspectors, in, after inspections by CMS, 
They found dirty floors and sinks, soiled in instruments and towels identified as contaminated or reprocessed, residue on sterile instrument trays, and poor hand hygiene practices, outdated sterile devices and supplies. Look at those uh, expiration dates. Endoscopes infected uh, 819 heart surgery patients with E. coli, 19. Within a two week period, it was a leak that was identified. It was intended to be repaired, but it was not quarantined and was put in back, back into use. And I'll give you a little bit more history on that particular one. The individual had been very uh, good about identifying that there was an issue that needed to be corrected, but went out on a lunch break, did not put any notification on the instrument and it went into processing and he kind of just assumed that it had been taken away, forgetting he had not identified it. Several infants have, uh, in 2006-7 infant, infants were infected, bacterial infections uh, contracted in Los Angeles, NICU unit, uh, inconsistent with uh, and improper cleaning practices were the result, were the cause. Thousands of patients notified of possible infection. Endoscope irrigation tube was rinsed but the scope was not disinfected. In Tennessee, we had thousands uh, were notified of possible infections. Misassembled endoscopes were, they had replaced one, uh, one way valves with two way valves. In Ottawa, 6,800 patients were notified that they may have been exposed to infectious agents as improper cleaning protocols were not always followed. And I, we're really gonna hit that a little bit later on. This in, is an amazing inspection. We have dirty instruments in the sterile trays, specifically orthopedic bone trays. In one documented case, they had three out of three trays in one day had instruments with bone or cement on them. Residue and debris on sterile instruments in, in sterile surgical containers all ready for the patient. A dirty and grimy sink in sterile processing department work area a number of outdated sterile devices and other outdated supplies. The uh, team, and these are all quotes exactly from the report, failed to ensure the integrity and cleanliness of surgical suites, procedure rooms, and sterile processing department. And finally, a technician who washed dirty surgical instruments with gloves on in front of the inspector, I might add, uh, then opened a door and answered the phone without removing wet gloves. So you think, but not in our facility. In this case, in 2009, Department of Vet Affairs had 10,737 U.S. veterans were contacted because they may have been infected by dirty endoscopes, just not clean properly and disinfected properly. In 2015, many are now positive for HIV, hepatitis B or hepatitis C of that original uh, uh, problem. Physical safety failures. ASCs not constructed, arranged, maintained uh, to ensure patient safety. Electrical junction boxes, missing covers. Fire safety inadequate. System tested but never reached the fire department. So they never had the alarm to come in that uh, uh, drill. No record of smoke testing. Did not have two spare sprinklers for each type and temperature rating uh, installed with at least six backups in a cabinet identified somewhere in the facility. These are actual sightings that were done at ASCs. 64 gallon garbage can in a, a copy room, soil, linen tr and trash receptacles are not allowed to be above 32 gallons capacity. Portal space heaters, and I, I would be probably guilty of this and it just can't be. Portable space heaters are not, uh, were found in admitting desks and uh, in administration offices, and they're not allowed. Failed to maintain hazardous rooms, not labeled correctly, no self-closing latch doors. Failed to maintain and document testing emergency lighting in the OR and outside the emergency generators. Failure to properly maintain boiler and water quality for steam sterilizers, 
huge no-no. Failed to ensure doctor's orders were signed and dated, and several orders were illegible. Failed to wear CDC appropriate PPE and separate clean from dirty reusables. Surge protector was plugged into another surge protector. Handy, I mean, hand hygiene was not practiced after glove removal. No separate sink for wa hand washing. No uh, emergency eye rinse or shower station. Did not have acceptable water quality for final rinse or cleaned devices, which may be different for different devices, by the way. Failure to calibrate the detergent and chemical dispenser volumes routinely and had thus had varying amounts added to different um, sterilization, chemical dispens uh, uh, disinfectants. Debris d observed on screen in the sterilizer, calcium deposits on the ster sterilizer walls especially those areas that have hard water. Automatic high-level disinfectant units are not cleaned thoroughly or frequently, and ultrasonic uh, cleaners are not emptied, cleaned, and rinsed thoroughly or frequently. Dirty endoscopes and other devices are left over the weekend. Insufficient separation between clean, dirty, uh, reusable devices. Cleaning closet was not isolated and used only for decontamination. Medical, uh, uh, instead of industrial forced air used in SPD. And I'd like to explain that. Sounds almost like you should use medical air, right? Well, no, because that way it can end up in the system and end up in a patient who is having, it was on uh, uh, a life supporting oxygen. The, um, Insufficient assigned responsibilities and documentation is completed uh, disinfection tasks. No record of it being done, even though it's done, you don't get credit for it, has to be written up. Kalea was, had four heart disinf uh, defects. They cut into the bone during surgery, opened the chest of this seven month old, exposing, exposing the heart uh, to repair life threatening defects for. They connected her to the heart bypass machine. They stopped when the suction began to clog. Something was happening. They inserted a wire into the tube. They found copious amounts of dark a black substance. The tubing had not been cleaned or the internal parts of the in a machine. And it came out and this came out of the instrument. They had to cover her chest with a sterile drape while procuring a new setup and new bypass was started. It was a happy ending. Kalea survived and is doing well, but it could have gone horribly, horribly wrong very, very easily. Finding and fixing missing SPD requirements. No one is taking the time. This is an individual who started in at a new facility. The manager was let go and she came in to to investigate uh, wh where do we stand, where do we start off, found that no one was taking responsibility for what they needed to, to have done uh, from an environmental or environment or an engineering perspective. She set up this task of uh, this chart to help people learn and then to observe them and make sure that they were doing things properly in order to get the, the uh, um, department back on track. Things did not look good. They were not, they were not going to pass the next inspections. If they didn't, their facility would be fined, likely make a bad press in, in the news, lose future uh, elective surgery patients, and most frequently, potentially cause patient post-surgical uh, complications. The, uh, she was asked with this new job, fix it. Staff were not happy to see their new boss and definitely did not like her at first. Things need to change, she started off her speech. She was tasked with this new job, fix it. Uh, I'm sorry, um, but this was too important for her to ignore or to feel bad about because they had to protect their patients, their facility, their own personal responsibilities and reputation, their full CMS 
responsibilities and uh, their full, I'm sorry, CMS uh, reimbursements. The competency, the ownership, professional pride is the pathway. And after they pass their next uh, CMS uh, audit, uh, they were very extremely proud and gained new, gained new professional pride. This, and again, this is the type of thing that helps to keep records uh, of this is new, and it helps the uh, participants remember what they're supposed to be um, up on, if you will. First, you need to have the right setup and the workflow in, in sterile processing departments. Yes, it'll be part of the inspection. So whether you're a full grade hospital or you have your own specialty area. This is the type of setup that needs to occur in a larger hospital. Notice the separation of the clean on the left uh, on your left, as you're looking at it, and on the right, you've got the uh, uh, decontamination area. Uh, in comes the soiled things, and it is rotated around. Uh, then you have the anti-fatigue mats, and I'm going to say that out loud because of our OSHA, with our constantly standing, we really do need that for the comfort and the uh, physical protection of our workers. Notice uh, that we're just uh, down from where it says the anti-fatigue mats. We have the rinse, uh, we have the uh, soiled items and they go into soak uh, following from left to right. Then we have the leak test area, then we have sonication for the uh, ultrasonic equipment. We have the wash and we have the rinse. It doesn't of course need to be in that same uh, area, but it's just, it certainly can be in its own units, but that is the flow that you want to have. Uh, you have forced air at both the dirty side and uh, rinsing and clean side. You have treated water for your rinse. Uh, that's the perfect condition. Notice the work tables in the center where you can see the IFUs uh, and really remember what each of the, what the equipment needs and what my, the standing operating procedures are. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to be exactly like this, but that same sort of idea and flow. You have the PPE storage and change area up top. You have your emergency eye and, and uh, wash showers. Uh, and then over on the left, you have at the bottom, you actually have uh, throughputs into high level disinfection area because that should actually be done on the clean side. You have throughput to, to uh, sterilization for the items that are ready to be sterilized, wrapped and sterilized. And then notice the eye station. It is all alone by itself. And a little bit later on the talk, we'll see how important that is because so many things can really screw up a good eye surgery and cause devastating effects to vision. Okay, I've gone through that and the same thought process applies if you have just a small area. You, aren't, you don't have the luxury of a large area setting up the same sort of thought process of dirty through the, the uh, pre-soak and the rinse, uh, uh, the reprocessor assessor area, um, and still having some sort of a delineation between the dirty side and then the clean side. Because think of the autoclave as you're, you're opening it up and uh, after things are sterile, but if you didn't have those dividers, you would have it coming almost directly across from the dirty area. Uh, just thinking things goes through and, and if you don't have the space, one, if you can possibly demand it or if they're remodeling to be able to do it, but two, think of what I can do to make a difference so that I don't have flow through or accidental leaving dirty things on, on clean sides. Oh yes, my, my arrows, my arrows. SPD, phys the physical designation of it itself, uh, especially um, if you're ever redesigning, each area should have a minimum of 10 air exchanges per hour. Uh, clean air, a clean area should ha be 20 to 23 degrees centigrade or 68 to 73 Fahrenheit. Uh, because PPE in is, it needs to be much colder in decontamination, so the PPE real really is uh, worn uh, so much heavily over on that side, and thus it really should be 16 to 18 degrees centigrade and 60 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It's harder to do if you don't have it, but that does not mean to set up a fan because the fans are not allowed. 
uh, not only, I, I realize how nice it is to have on your face, but you are going to be blowing those organisms around from decontam into uh, the more open spaces over in clean room. Um, and needless to say, you don't want those organisms over there. Uh, relative humidity is maintained between 30 to 60 percent and recorded daily, not over 70 percent in uh, storage areas and below 30 percent in preparation and sterilization can lead to excessive dry wrap. If you have excessive dry wrap, it will absorb the steam and the, or the, and the high hum, or the humidity in uh, ethylene oxide and won't necessarily penetrate down to where it needs to be on the products and do the sterilization job it needs to do. Um, unless, and some companies do have uh, proof of uh, doing it well below the 70% and ha I mean, I'm sorry, way, yeah. Um, and, and uh, still being able to fully sterilize. So something to check on. Ceilings, flush against the surface, no shedding materials. The pipes should be recessed and enclosed, no condensation from the pipes. No stained ceiling tiles, which is often a, a bugaboo that gets written up. Uh, if you have wet stained uh, ceiling tiles or that are just stained and thus it's dried up, you probably also have fungus, fungi, fungus in the area um, and uh, could be coming out into the room. So make sure that that is something that it's so easy to change and fix uh, and you don't want to be written up for and you certainly don't want to have fungus around. No no dry sweeping. You just can't use brooms in decontam or into the clean room area uh, because it brings everything up. Uh, adequate lighting space ergonomics to facilitate optimal work conditions, lighting and positioned uh, forward of uh, work so there's no shadow. You want to be able to see it rather than having the light right on top or in back of you rather um, that might shade what you're doing on, on those nice little tiny uh, instruments. Uh, the um, floors and walls must be made of material that can be wiped down every day and cleaned with chemo chemical agents and not hurt them and, or start to de degrade them. The signs designated uh, authorized personnel only must be placed and uh, people must do abide by it uh, and decontamination areas should be called out so they know when they're walking into it on both sides of the room or wherever they have access. Good traffic control is an absolute must. OSHA emergency ice wash uh, and shower within 10 seconds or 30 meters. And I emphasize that because it's being written up in a lot of the different uh, uh, in, in inspections. Uh, as I said, no, span, no fans in the area, but that'll help you remember. Staff training, reprocessing reusable dis, uh, devices. Training starts before, but always continues throughout our, our profession. Even sometimes when we think, oh gee, I've heard this before. The reminder is always important and the documentation that that has been done routinely is important as well as the supervisor watching you to make sure it is continuing to be done properly. Don't get upset that you're not being questioned. It is just important if S S standard processing has been changed or SOPs have been changed or anything else, it is their requirement, their responsibility to check on the efficacy and the uh, uh, that steps are being followed. No employer should be allowed to work decontamination without being thoroughly trained as they come aboard. Uh, to ensure safety um, of both the patient, but also of their own, themselves. Basic microbiology, types, uh, infection routes, uh, mucous membranes, uh, in inhalation, ingestion, dro droplets, airborne, contact, all of these are parts of infection prevention that need to be studied, need to be part of the course of that training. Why patients are so much more vulnerable to few pathogens. Do you have staff that think of, well, you're so concerned about my patient, the patient so much more than you're concerned about me. There's a difference between we that are healthy and those that are having surgery when their anesthesia, their treatments, their postdoc, the surgery itself, all put them at much greater risk to infection, meaning less organisms and, a different, and additional types of organisms can cause infection for them versus uh, uh, staff that are working 
uh, or any other individuals who are just not in that patient uh, position. Personal protective equipment, uh, PPE, what, why, how, removal, care are all different parts of inspection. Self-contamination prevention, the physical safety, infection prevention, and OSHA, uh, which would be in, in the United States, our group that makes sure that workers are safe, are all important for the inspection. Extreme importance of following the manufacturer's instruction. Again and again and again, that's, that's emphasized. The devices may change. Maybe you have a different model and the old ones are still in your binder or, or your um, uh, documents online and you haven't changed them yet. And then they, they may be processed improperly and can cause problems with the patient. Uh, extreme importance of following the manufacturer's instructions, hand washing, why, when, where, how, with what, proper medical device handling, point of use through the handoff and the, to the clean side, emphasizing that. The uh, environmental clean and disinfection, how, when, and make sure that it is documented, and so much more. The uh, department heads are actively involved and perform or assigns Become uh, competency evaluations routinely. As we we're saying, don't take offense. This is a learning experience, uh, but hopefully, it is also an opportunity to say, "Gee, you're doing it perfectly right." Written policies and procedures tied to, and you can see the whole list there. And every country will have so many more in, uh, uh, for their own country. Uh, JC, CMS, FDA. Uh, AAA, HC, and CDC auditors want to see policies and procedures in place, accessible. It doesn't do any good if it's in the manager's office and sitting there. You want it to, to be accessible while you're doing your projects, your different uh, t tasks, rather, and performed on specific standards. If I did this, why am I doing that? What reference can I reference that says, do it this way? make sure that it is it is referenced. Ask staff if they think that there are better ways to do something. You know what, they're out there every day. I'm speaking to the managers now and the supervisor. So they're out there every day doing the tasks and they stop and think, gee, you know what, I could follow the rules much better if this were over there or if I had a different type of tool or the brushes that fit or whatever the thing is. Uh, but don't just be silent about it. Tell the manager, tell the supervisor so that they understand jeepers. Yeah, I can do that. Uh, uh, the uh, If there are procedures that need to be changed, they're no longer appropriate, change them right away, as I'm emphasizing a bit, because it is often written up in inspections. Organization support for SPD addressing, reprocessing, how-tos, musts, and procedures and recommendations. I will show several along the way, whether they're from ISHIM, uh, ASHIP, uh, AORN, SGNA, AMI, and I could probably go on and on uh, where different instructions are to, for especially for your own specialties. One of the nice things about ASCs is that they're specialty oriented. They're really looking at one area, which makes it so much easier to have repetitive processes because you've got the same type of instruments. And that's a, a big plus for ASCs. May not be one, maybe two or three, but at least it's more focused. Outpatient facilities, and this is for ASCs, and they're very specific. They have one for the hospitals and they have one for ASCs. These are free guides at CDC. And uh, for, for example, this is a guide to infection prevention for outpatient settings minimum expectations for safe care. They list them, uh, they're both in, they have both the instructions are in Spanish and in English versions, as well as the checklist. So you can do your own internal audits. We have to do them in manufacturing, we have to do them in pharmaceuticals, and they should be doing them in sterile processing areas, as well as in the entire ASCs. And, and keeping records of those, signing off on them. We did it, we found a problem, okay. You know what, it's great you found the problem when you're doing a self audit. You go ahead and, and then you turn uh, uh, list it, say what it is, list what the intended way to fix it is and when it will be done 
and then you sign off that it has been completed, invest, uh, inspected and completed on that date. That goes a long way to an inspector appreciating the fact that you're doing the right thing very professionally. So now let's get three. When we look at uh, pre-cleaning, transporting, cleaning, disinfection, and handing off at the end of the shift. Point of use, pre-cleaning, transport, uh, it, it is extremely, incredibly important. This is one of the most important parts of sterile processing is what's done be just before sterile processing as it comes out of the operating room. Immediately after the instrument is used, uh, the, um, uh, the technicians can, in, I forget that we have many company, countries and I, I keep using abbreviations, I apologize. In the first uh, scrub roll, responsible for wiping blood and tissues off instruments with sterile water moistened sponge. Okay, do not use a sterile saline because it starts to degrade many of the different metals. Uh, lumens are flushed with sterile water from a syringe, just push it on through, and instruments that are no longer needed in the surgery should be placed in a uh, basin with sterile water to soak. Such as, as such as these, you see the acetabulums, the uh, reamers there, uh, and the drills. Uh, there are just so many reasons and so many gunks that can gunk that uh, blood and tissues and and uh, uh, various debris that can get stuck everywhere and cause uh, severe um, potential for infections. Dries on there. That's why you want to soak it right away. Drying on is something. Uh, if you can picture it, just just closing your eyes for a minute and see that, that there's a little bit of blood on there. It's dried on there. Uh, underneath, I had a few organisms in the case uh, in the time that it became it was uh, sitting out there. And now what a biofilm can grow. And it's protected by that dried on blood or dried on gunk. And it's almost impossible to 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 get off. Uh, especially if it's a small amount that you can't see very well. Um, and then you've got multiplying organisms that are protected underneath in a biofilm, which also is uh, harder to, to uh, uh, dis disinfect anything. Okay, so get rid of the organic soiling as soon as possible. Instruments not wiped should be disassembled and placed in the sterile water as soon as possible. <laughs> disassembling it so it can get into into the grooves as much as it can or spray with foam enzymes which i'm a big believer in as far as containing then and they contain that contains surfactants that helps to loosen the organic debris and it starts to digest the different uh, elements uh, and prevent resettling on the instruments uh, in, uh, surfaces. Blood and other organics dry to the surface between 15 and 20 minutes. We talked about the drying. 15 and 20 minutes it will be starting to reach that stage. It'll be pretty much to that stage. Once dried on, hard to remove, and uh, awaiting press transport, the blood, the tissue, the residues are causing stain and pitting and corrosion. So it's not only just hard, but starting to hurt the instruments. Need more time? Place uh, in an original container or and add if needed to, uh, uh, to contain a liquid. Uh, you may need to place it in something else. Uh, and you can see examples down at the bottom. Uh, the Add the warm water, if you can, or just water, and wetting agents or enzymes with surfactants, spray foam to keep them moist. And this, now, later on, we'll say, you don't want it moist, you want to really dry it. But right here at this stage, you want to keep it moist because you don't want it to dry out. And if it's moist and a few organisms grow there, um, they are not, they're still going to be floating around hopefully and uh, not to the point of drying on the instrument. Cover with a moist towel, uh, plastic bag, lid, keep moisture, but not sloshing. So not so much moisture, you're gonna to start to slosh around as you're moving towards the decontamination area. In fact, uh, the top layers may still be exposed and not be wet, wet. Um, that's a great time to put a moist towel over it to keep them moist and yet not uh, allow sloshing. And label it as a uh, uh, biohazard so that nobody is going to look in it. Oh, wow, this is neat, it's a lid and open it up and look. Okay, so what they soak in is important, it, it, and what they soak in can croak them. 
See, I thought it was very proud I did all right. All right, do not use hard water, dish soap, iodine, chlorhexidine, bleach, or saline, as they can cause stains and pitting. Many of your new employees will think that they're doing the right thing by adding saline because it's come out of a patient, right? And saline is good. Uh, or they may add bleach, thinking they're going to kill everything. But unfortunately, all of these things can really destroy instruments. And you see at the bottom those that have been hurt. Endoscopes. This is another one that needs to be cleaned immediately, even in the procedural room. Um, so that you're not having anything drying. The procedure, you wipe it down with one of the sponges, whether they're pre-made is especially for that use or just um, uh, some other type of sponge so that's wiped off on the out side right away. And then you go ahead and suck in the uh, uh, water through so that you're pulling out or pushing through. Uh, the pulling out is much better because you're not going to create an aerosol uh, through the lumen of the endoscope. Brushes and sponges used for pre-cleaning cannot be rinsed off and hung off the next time. Does that sound like a stupid statement? Unfortunately, it has been found that in a lot of different, several different facilities, they've been written up because they'll clean it with a brush, then they'll the lumen that the, or other instruments with a brush. It is now uh, contaminated, right? So they'll rinse it off with the water they have right there. Then they'll hang it up in an area to dry with in, in that procedure room and never pay attention again and use it the next time. Uh, needless to say, the organisms are growing on the brushes and in the wire in between. If you've got those that have the twisted wire holding the bristles, uh, that's going to be uh, you know coated with the organisms that are growing in a biofilm. Um, so that's just an absolute no-no. You need to take it out and have it cleaned and disinfected. Suction, uh, I already said that. Uh, I'm going to be on. Um, hey, dude, they wiped and flushed the, the food supply right away from us and uh, before we could secure it. Uh, why, why that sounds like a silly statement. Bacteria will search a surface and see if it is uh, compatible to being able to build a biofilm. And it will be compatible if it's moist with food on it. Uh, can't start a biofilm here because there's nothing to keep us supplied uh, to support our biofilm. In endoscope transport, it's a little bit different as far as you can't just stick it in with the instruments, obviously, because it's going to poke and, and, and uh, potentially scratch or puncture the endoscope. Place the endoscope loosely coiled in a safe container free from items that could puncture it, uh, and avoid kinking it. So don't make the, the, the coil so tight that you're starting to kink things that could hurt the light source and could, could hurt different uh, um, parts of the endoscope itself. And um, the next time the doctor starts to use it, unfortunately, he doesn't have the correct vision. The uh, cover with the enzyme solution, a foam, a spray to degrade the organics uh, so, so more easily clean. Check the IFUs to make sure that it's going to be compatible with that device and the buffers and surfactants are used. The Keep it moist and covered with a towel sealed in plastic or secured lin, lin, lid, sorry, uh, mark contaminated biohazards. The different enzymes you can use, the protease is for proteins, the amylase is for carbohydrates, the lipase are for fats. Um, this, your detergent surfactants can do a pretty well job of that for the fats, but um, depending upon what endoscope you're using, different types of tissues may be, uh, um, need different types of enzymes. Uh, the part of the, we talked about surfactants, they're very important to have as part of the enzyme detergent mix. The surfactants are going to help to loosen the different debris, but they'll also, after it's been digested by the enzymes, will prevent them from getting back on the instrument. So uh, the, having the appropriate surfactant is also important just to check it. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, and sterile processing is getting ready to receive personal pr protective, um, uh, gets in their personal protective equipment as they start to receive things from um, that have been just prepped from uh, the surgery. One of the things I want to emphasize, whether you're in the operating room, whether you're in sterile processing, whether you're in decon, 
or in the, on the clean side. Rings and things are not appropriate. There are 10 times the number of bacteria on hands of nurses that wear rings. It's Staphylococcus aureus, gram-negative bacillus, Candida albicans, or Candida our species, I should say, higher if uh, uh, more, and then it's even higher if you have more rings. Uh, and you don't need to keep them there. If you think about it, though, uh, like this person in the center, that's a ring, and you see the uh, allergic reaction that it has on it? That's actually because there was soap, didn't get rinsed off underneath the ring. Turns out she was allergic to that soap. And uh, if it can't get slippery soap, out from under a ring when they wash their hands, how in the world are they gonna take bacteria that are clinging on for dear life underneath the ring uh, from from being uh, rinsed off uh, or even the soap getting rinsed off with it. It just has to be, uh, it leaves the jewelry at home. No artificial nails or decorative decals, no earrings, no necklaces, no vinyl gloves because they are great when you first get them out of the bag and you fill them with water, they look fine. You start working around or uh, getting abraded or reaching things and, and kinking it, it will start to break down. They just don't belong in, in uh, decontamination. Personal protective equipment, PPP of all uh, at all times in decontamination because you've got dirty areas around you. Separate PPE area storage and changing just for decon. So the scrubs are laundered by the facility, wet soiled, change uh, so that you're not bringing them home. Uh, not an official part of PPE, however, you, you should wear a head covering in the uh, decontamination area and in the clean room area. I honestly believe it should also be on the outside when they're dealing with patients in a hospital, um, but um, unfortunately it's not required. The uh, fluid resistance barriers, jump suit, uh, apron with sleeves, gowns, all of those as appropriate to your facility. And the, and the rules that you're following the standard by. Fluid resistant shoe covers, heavy duty gloves on the outside. You can wear thinner ones on the inside. That does increase the protection if you were able to puncture or to slice the outer glove. It definitely has uh, many publications that show that decreases what would go through to your, your own glove, your own skin, I'm sorry. The face mask, and safety glasses either wrap around, making sure that they're covering uh, the area on the sides as well. Uh, and then you can also wear goggles or face shield. Face shields seem like they're doing the best protection. You need to know what you're doing because if you're doing something that you're actually kind of looking up with them and working down here, of course you can get splash that comes up uh, in front of the uh, um, uh, face shield. Also, if you're wearing a face shield, it does not mean that you don't wear a mask. You need to wear a mask uh, for protection and it should be fluid resistant. Uh, remove the PPE when, before leaving decon, reusable gloves, wash uh, inside out to dry so that the inside does not become uh, moldy or anything else. You want it to be able to dry on the inside before you don it next time. The wash the hands in the hand wash sink. Okay, that's another thing that's been written out a lot. Uh, often you don't have a hand wash sink. Again, if you're remodeling or if you have any opportunity and extra money, uh, it, it, you need to be doing the sink separately um, because you're washing your hand in the same place that you've got the dirty devices that just doesn't uh, compute. You just can't do that and you will be written up. Um, so some sort of resolution needs to be done with that. Or if not, if you can't right away, then somehow set it up so that you have to clean out the sink before you wash your hands. And I know that's a pain in the neck, uh, but you in that, write an SOP for whatever you're gonna do so that the inspector sees it. Okay, what about taking off my PPE? This is very important because assume everything that you're wearing is contaminated. Uh, and think about how to take it off. Uh, there are two different ways that CDC recommends, and I prefer the second way. Um, you, just because you can take your gown off at the same time, it helps to take the gloves off. 
uh, follow it, post it, whatever your methods you're using, be sure it's posted so people remember. And so the inspector can see that you've got it set up there so that you're not contaminating yourself. One of the areas I really wanna emphasize that, especially now with coronavirus, is that the front of the mask is going to be contaminated. It's, you're like a vacuum cleaner when you suck in and the organisms, coronavirus, any other bacteria that you're working on decontam, um, it's going to, they're going to be on the front or can be on the front. And for something like coronavirus, it's alive for seven days. So you can imagine how long uh, some of the other organisms can also last that long because um, it, coronavirus, believe it or not, is really sort of fragile. Um, seven days, it can stay alive on the front of your mask. So don't take your mask off by touching it. Take it off on the back, as you see in the pictures there, and take it over to the garbage by the uh, straps, or uh, and then uh, jump it in the or drop it into the um, uh, disposal area, your trash area that's appropriate. Um, okay, and we're just saying different ways there. Use surgical instruments, endoscopes, etc. Enter the decontamination area. Okay, now I've got the stuff in the dirty. I've got it into the decontamination. You must have written policies and procedures for everything, and they must be readily accessible to the staff. Includes all the manufacturing, the, the uh, uh, instructions for use, as we've said before. Now, this can be a little tricky because you can contaminate it even if it's in a plastic shielded thing uh, with your hands if, if uh, you haven't done all the proper washing and everything to go look at the binder, basically. Uh, in many cases, it's, it's nicer to have it set up on the computer, but at the same time, you need to be careful that you're not contaminating uh, the computer. No, nothing's ever easy. We like to make things hard, as, but think, think like a, a germ. Where would you be? Where could you be and still surviving and be ready to jump on a new host? It must be you must strictly uh, be followed all the SOPs, the personal responsible and accountable for sterility, make certain that all procedures are strictly followed. If sterility cannot be achieved or maintained, the system has failed, policies and procedures uh, must haves coming now. Decontamination, sterilization, cleaning of all reusable items, disposing of disposable items, packaging and labeling of items, loading and uploading of the sterilizer, operating the sterilizer. These are all uh, things that we must do, things that must be written up and a person assigned for responsibility to those items. Monitoring and maintaining records of each cycle. This is in the sterilization area. Adhering to safety precautions and preventing ma uh, maintenance protocols. Uh, storing of sterile items, rotating, uh, controlling the visitors and the pests. And sometimes the visitors are the pests, I realize. But um, in, this, in this area, making sure that we don't have mice or cockroaches or something in sterile uh, storage area that could be contaminating our items that are waiting to go into uh, to, uh, the operating room. Handling sterile items ready for use and making sterile uh, transfer to the uh, um, uh, sterile field. All of these things need to have SOPs and to be spelled out and followed. Uh, uh, the decontamination process as soon as possible. It's been delivered to, into your area. You want to immediately uh, protect the, the instruments in the, in the rigid containers. The OR must realize how damaging piled up higher and deeper really is bad, as you can see in these pictures below. Uh, things are getting ruined. Thing, things are, are being damaged. Dispose of single-use items, sort out into instruments, basins, sharps, delicate items, and immersibles. So I've actually showed you a little bit more that should have been done uh, before they left the OR. Uh, disassemble the items according to the IFU. Keep the parts together. And in, 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 in sterile processing, you're going to be putting uh, like into a little tea container, strainer sort of container made for this purpose, the uh, devices, the small parts that are are uh, now separated so that you can do the appropriate uh, cleaning and disinfection. Pre-wash, soak, and rinse items before proceeding to cleaning. 
when the endoscope reaches the decontamination unit leak testing. I'm gonna emphasize this, it's not done enough. It's done, but it's not done enough. Let's pretend that on day Monday, uh, I do a leak test and a leak test says, everything's good. I have no air coming from any place that it shouldn't be coming to in the bubbles. Uh, I, I've done my testing. It's you know, not, it doesn't have any leak problems. Uh, somehow during cleaning or reprocessing or during, uh, the, while the dock is using it, somehow there's been a kink and it caused a disruption in some of the, one of the areas uh, that there's not supposed to be any leakage through on Tuesday. Uh, on then on Monday, uh, the next Monday, I go ahead and test it again because I'm only testing it once a week. How many patients have now been exposed to what was ever on that leak area? Because I try to clean those, I think everything's fine, and yet the organisms are stuck in that area that I can't get my water or my my uh, uh, brush to, and it's multiplied, and now I have a biofilm. I know I say biofilm a lot, but it is really uh, the enemy of sterile processing. Um, and it has not been able to be high level disinfected or processed appropriately. So they really to be, do need to be leak tested every day because I assure you, if you wait three or four days you and you have had a leak in there, someplace that's got a little area that couldn't be accessed, you will have a biofilm. Okay, then as we progress, sorry, I don't mean to be so adamant, uh, take a failure out of the circulation, tag immediately and quarantine for repair. I, I say this specifically, I don't think I've told you this before, but uh, that occurred, uh, an individual did find a leak. He, he, he was all ready to tag it. Uh, they called him for lunch. He went to lunch, assuming to come back and handle it. Um, came back, it was gone. He assumed that some, his friend had, had handled it. And so he went on with his work. Unfortunately, it turned out that there were several people that were infected because of that uh, error. Uh, it did not go to maintenance. It was not fixed. And uh, it, it harbored biofilm day after day after day because, assuming it later, no one had done another leak check. Uh, temperatures must be, these are for the enzymes. En enzymes work optimally in certain temperatures. Usually it is 38 degrees centigrade or 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They, uh, otherwise they're too slow. If it's colder, they get slow and they're really not doing their job. Uh, and if it's 60 degrees centigrade or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, then they start to degrade. So it's a happy medium right on the inside for the most effective and speedy activity of the enzyme. Um, and then we go on to the next one. Oh, yes. Now you can see my dramatic uh, work of the, the uh, uh, enzyme, Pac-Man. Surfactants are, are usually included to help that cleaning agents make it better uh, and penetrate deeper into crevices and areas. They change the surface tension uh, and they keep the debris from redepositing. That's what I think I noted before. Brushing should be done under the water. Have you ever got it where you're just up here and you know you're scrubbing it, def you want it and you're definitely doing the right thing, uh, and especially with little things where you really want to see it? Well, unfortunately, you're creating an aerosol as well. That's not safe for you as you're, as you're doing your work. Um, uh, figure out where you are and get it ready and then put it under the, just under the water so you can do the brushing there and it will trap then uh, the... Uh, spray that's coming out. And it's the same with thing with an endoscope. If you take a brush down an endoscope and as you bring it out, those bristles, you know, they're kind of like this to, to go in, to go in, and then to come back out. And as soon as they reach the lip then of coming out, they, they splash out. And when they, they stretch back out, they are making, creating an aerosol. So another thing, you want to be very careful to have it down into the sink area so that um, that that uh, whip back out is being contained is is uh, uh, an area that's not going to be way up in your face okay just thinking about it all the time and using the right tools the right diameter and taper the right length the right flexibility and stiffness the right tip design the right bristle type stiffness and density 
uh, because you want to be able to disrupt, disrupt the biofilm and dried tissues and blood as much as possible. Hopefully you haven't had a biofilm start yet, uh, but the new ones within the first several hours are weak. They're weak, they're just building. The construction isn't done, the drying out isn't done. So uh, they are the easiest, that's the easiest time to get them. Uh, they, uh, the um, brushes aren't worn out, the bristles do not shed. Um, and, and you'll find in the IFU or you'll find what, what was recommended by the manufacturer for cleaning the instrument, that's what you need to use. Or if they sent a, a brush with your device, you say, that's a great bus, Bryce, <laughs> the brush, but it's very expensive. Um, the, the, following the manufacturers and getting there is probably the best, but if it's you're not don't have that option, you can measure it and figure out what you're supposed to get so that it reaches everything it's supposed to reach and whatever it's supposed to clean uh, as recommended by that manufacturer. Look down at the bottom, um, the things that can be pulled out of lumens. Uh, the one that's on black in black and white, you can see the debris that's inside. That surgeon was actually upset because he was having problems with eye surgery. That's magnified quite a bit. And in the eye surgery, he, they said, look, doc, we did everything we're supposed to and hands it to him. He says, he said, you know, I want to check it. He opened it up and he sliced it with a knife and opened it up. And that is actually what he found. And those crystals or debris ended up inside the eye of this patient. Uh, the big ones probably, big chunks, maybe not have made it in there, but the little pieces that came from it and caused uh, severe damage in several of his patients. And uh, also when doing it, or scrubbing, okay, I'm, I'm emphasizing scrubbing and, and, and so much you're probably saying, I am really gonna scrub it. Now I'm gonna say, but be careful because you can scratch things, especially if your brushes aren't the correct or if you don't have a tip at the end, you see at the bottom right, that's a good tip, it's being protected uh, for, uh, coming out of that endoscope. But if, if somehow you get scratches on the inside of your endoscope or any instrument, the bacteria love it and that's what you're seeing there. Now the, the in preparation of this uh, uh, in, in an electron microscope, a scanning electron in microscope, the method of preparation, you you can't see the biofilm that was covering it. Uh, it's been destroyed, but that allows you to see the bacteria that are all lined up and happy and already three quarters of the way protected. And they'll just rebuild their biofilm if you let them. And, and also as those brushes start to wear down, they're no longer effective. So make sure that you're not reusing it, thinking you're doing a good thing by saving money and unfortunately um, not cleaning the instruments appropriately. This is a shoulder surgery. This uh, Mr. Harrison is a 63 year old oil salesman in Texas. He had a, a scar and it was hot to the touch after his surgery, he went home and, and uh, within days or a couple weeks later, he started to, you know, it is really hurting, but just like so many men, okay, I said it just like the men, uh, and also healthcare workers will often uh, not go in, but um, he keep, kept thinking it's gonna get better going to get better. Um, it started to ooze then. And he said it was actually like, and this is a quote, it oozed pus like butter squeezed from a tube. Blah. So another two weeks later, kept thinking it would get better. He went back seven hour drive to the hospital. Infection was pseudomonas. It had eaten away part of his rotator cuff, cuff and his shoulder. Uh, bone Screws were loosened, sutures came loose. Six surgeries and over two and a half years later, he still can't lift his arm. It's still extremely painful even during the rest of the day. Um, and this is, uh, unfortunately, wasn't isolated, not an isolated incident. Seven more knee and shoulder surgical side infections in that same facility over a two week period. CDC was invited to come in and they found two causes, the arthroscope shavers and the inflow outflow cannulas had this pseudomonas in it. Uh, unfortunately, um, the knee and shoulder surgery patients underwent similar types of infection as, as Harrison. 
The tissue, it was, they, these things were contaminated with tissue, bone debris, and even brush, I can never say it fast enough, brush bristles uh, found inside the lumen, as you can see on the right, which is a picture from one of those lumens. Sometimes we think not in our facility. Azizi, in, in, as a, a very responsible risk manager in a particular large university medical center, took a, a camera down the lumen of 350, all of their sterilized and ready to use suction tips in one hospital. Every single one contained debris, including tissue, blood, bone, or just gunk. Uh, almost every surgical tray contains inflow outflow cannulas. Not in our facility, you say. How do you know if you don't look? How can you fix it if you don't know? How is it not uh, partially your fault if the associated uh, uh, post surgical complications occur? Look to the left, the bottom left, that is a boroscope. And the instrument that is used then goes, the light uh, helps to be able to visualize things, obviously, inside the, the instrument. And then it goes into the computer screen so that you can actually see it occurring, which is uh, very nice. Now, a lot of times you can test it with a swab and find out whether that particular unit um, has organic debris. And that would be the blood or the tissue or the gunk. Um, uh, that you could find because it's it would be an organic component and do a protein test or one of the other tests. But um, if it has the things on the right hand side, the rust, the debris and things like that, it may not pick that up. So um, getting in there and really understanding if there's been damage, scratching, anything, uh, problems with inside the scope is very helpful. Uh, to understanding or to preserving your patient safety. Nicks and scratches open the door for metal damage and hiding places for bacteria to start uh, biofilm. Worn spots can rust during autoclaving. Protective coatings are scratched away or itched away. Uh, oxygen can then access the inside metals that had been protected by that coating and they can start to react and cause reactions that can also get inside the patient. Uh, chipped plating it can harbor soil and damaged tissue and rubber gloves if or gloves, period. If such uh, problems are noticed during the inspection process, these instruments should be either cleaned again or sent for repair, depending upon what the problem is observed, but take care of your equipment, even if it is the surgeon's favorite one and it has problems. Uh, tabletop or the freestanding behemoth type large ultrasonic cleaners are really ultra cool. Um, then they perform a tremendous service to, to getting things out of crevices. But the prolong uh, surgical instrument life by getting the nitty gritty out of tight places and like lock boxes. The device IFU may state uh, the type of just um, uh, uh, the IFU, the type of uh, water, uh, whether you need to have deionized or non-sterile or sterile water in your, in your ultrasonic cleaner, low foaming detergents uh, with uh, enzymes in it, surfactants, chelating agents, uh, all make a difference in how effective the ultrasonic uh, cleaners are. Most units have heaters and presets or timers for manual set. Here we have an ultrasonic cleaner, it rinsed and refilled. You, and this is important, you put fresh water in there, you need to run it for 10 to 15 minutes before you add instruments because they develop, the fresh water has large uh, bubbles and it will then eat up basically the little bubbles that do the cleaning for the uh, ultrasonic cleaning. Uh, very important that you'd use that 15 minutes of running. This is just how actions, it would, if the, the little bubbles do a great job of pulling things out of tight places and destroying them. Rinse and dry, rinse well after manual and ultrasonic cleaning to remove the organic debris, detergents, surfactants, enzymes, uh, chelating agents. 
to ensure they are not interfering with the disinfectants and the sterilizations, that there's no left water or no fluids left inside, which would dilute the disinfectant, create wet packs, interact with ethylene oxide, all preventing uh, optimal outcomes. Leave residuals that could ha harm patients as well. So just making sure they're cleaned and that they are rinsed properly with the right level of water and that they are uh, dried. These are the different types of automatic cleaners that people are using now, all of which are great and do a standard, repeatedly doing it well job for those things that can go through such processing. Now give those stiff joints a lube job if you're using lubricant and it's recommended by the, the uh, manufacturer, very often it's not nowadays, but those who do it, you do it at this stage after it's gone through um, cleaning and it's ready then to be um, sterilized. Some, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Do not use WD-40, oil-based lubricants or oils with silicone in it, it for your instruments. That's just a no, 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 no. The rinse after disinfection, we talked about you need to get the right water for whatever your IFU says, whether it's tap water or potable water, deionized water, reverse osmosis water, um, sterile pyrogen-free water, such as for uh, eye, eye uh, surgery, must meet device specifications, chemicals, biological, organics, endotoxin, low and not present such as your reverse osmosis or your sterile pyrogen V uh, um, uh, water, the, they must remove the residual disinfectants and chemicals. You don't want them in the person. This is a, these are a list of different types of organisms that can be found in some of the waters, Acinetobac, Tyria, Burkholderia, Legionella, Mycobacterium, Pseudomonas, Serratia, and uh, Stenotrophomonas, all of which can cause surgical infections. The picture to the right is actually after using rinse water on an endoscope that was used, and uh, unfortunately, in the it had had lost its attachment of the line, the outer liner. Uh, of the endoscope, and organisms had gotten in there and were impossible to clean out. Um, and this happened to several patients before they realized what had happened. Uh, low level and intermittent disinfection should be processed and decontamination on the dirty side. But this is a, an important one. It's, it isn't a requirement yet, but it definitely is highly recommended and is hopefully soon to be a requirement. But high level disinfection should be performed on the clean side um, and it well controlled with air vents and everything, evacuation vents. So that's important for you, especially during your remodeling. Read the IFUs as we talked about and follow everything exactly as they should be. Why is it so important to have physically separated processing areas for ophthalmic uh, um, instruments? Let me show you the difference in ha what's happened. Down here at the bottom, they used uh, plasma sterilization for ophthalmic instruments without checking uh, with, for the, with the IFUs, and it turned out it degraded brass into copper and zinc and deposited into the patient's eyes, the corn, corneal decompensation, loss of visual acuity, irreversible injuries, uh, and uh, severe cases of blindness, severe cases of blindness, a visual loss of uh, visual acuity and blindness. Uh, toxic anterior segment syndrome, TAS, is a horrible word if you, if, if you do uh, eye surgery. It's not an infection. It occurs within 12 to 48 hours after surgery. Uh, healing ranges from back to 2020 all the way to total blindness, depending upon what it, the contaminant was and how long the patient waited to come in. Uh, a large facility, I mean, see, a large conference, the attendees, 52% of the attendees uh, of an eye conference said that they had seen at least one case uh, come out of their facility. 7% had more than five cases. Uh, abnormal pH, residual biofilm and tissues, irritants and sur surfaces of the uh, surgical instruments, detergent residue, corroded instruments, mixed metals in ultrasonic cleaners. That's a no-no, no mixed metals in ultrasonic cleaners. Make sure that you clean it out and wash out before you, you put another type of, of a metal in there. And then poorly rinsed devices, poor quality rinse water, heavy metals, 
had heat stable endotoxins, all, all endotoxins are heat stable, uh, particulates of any type and impurities in the autoclave, all of which can cause this task. Okay, if your steam sterilized, do you, don't cheat. Uh, can you answer these qu inspectors questions? Is the sterilizer labeled for this cycle uh, by the manufacturer? What is the sterilizer's manufacturer's recommended load for loading for that cycle? Is, contam is contaminated device labeled by the manufacturer for use in that cycle? What load configuration? Chemical indicators used and labeled for use in this cycle by its manufacturer? If biological indicators are used, is labeled for the use in this this uh, cycle, type of cycle, uh, was control from the same lot incubated on the same day, or, or are you looking at a control from a day before? If cycle used frequently, is it checked regularly for biological indicators? All of these things are important. The label, the loading, uh, and you're, in the U.S., we use the Amy ST79 is basically the, the strongest uh, um, standard to be recognizing for that. Don't forget your st making sure that the st steam is equally located in the um, uh, sterilizer. Use your Bowie Dix and uh, use your biologicals as you need them and with uh, implants, of course. Making sure that you're cleaning at the end of the shift. These are things caught by inspectors and how bad it can be. Uh, if we're not cleaning things, uh, those things are drying in there. Uh, they're, they're causing debris and they're causing a reduced uh, efficacy. It's sadly it, it, extremely relevant that uh, we have disaster planning. And now of all times, it seems that more and more that we need it. Think about this. What if right now you lost your electricity? You had no steam. You had no lights. You had fire. Uh, loss of outside communication, flood, hospital is quarantined, and it, uh, it's your facility, and you don't have any clothes, and you're stuck in there. Is your uh, SPD supplied? Are you and your family ready? Will SPD be able to disinfect, clean, sterilize instruments, especially as there may be increased need due to uh, injury or failure of other hospitals to be able to function? Must have written plan and must test it. Uh, and, and have that record that you've tested it. Recent failures of hospital generators have caused entire hospitals to have to move to a different hospital. Um, just because they hadn't tested it, they didn't realize it was no longer functioning properly. City loss of water pressure has resulted in insufficient water for sterilization, steam sterilization during disasters. What are your facilities backups? Go through it, make sure you are ready for a pandemic. Environmental cleaning, and I realize I am getting closer and closer out of time, so I'll, I'll talk a little faster, sorry. Very important, we create an environmental cleaning and disinfection a schedule chart, and that we, uh, what task is cleaned and disinfected, name of the individual that is responsible, uh, add uh, from which department they come, because some things, will, most things will be in SPD, in the SPD uh, area, sterile processing departments, but it also can be for engineering and custodial and safety for different things. Maybe it's checking the um, steam sterilizer boiler and various types of things. Uh, and when they're supposed to do it, it needs to be on that list of who's supposed to do it, what department they're from, and um, how frequently they're supposed to do it. And then they, they sign off on it when it's done. They make com comments to what needs to be fixed. And uh, then the, the supervisors come back to make sure that it has been fixed if, if there was something wrong. Uh, these records are kept for the inspector. Recommended practices, this is just AORN's uh, recommended practices, it, keeping up, making sure that we keep up with our environmental cleaning in the operating room and in the uh, sterile processing area. There are many others, but uh, this is definitely one that addresses the ASCs as well. Uh, decontamination unit is a biohazardous area. And I know you all think about it, and it's important to keep thinking about it. And having a sign or something that it reminds any visitors that might be popping in to look, this is not some place that they're supposed to be going into. Every instrument device that enters the decontamination area must be treated as if it is potentially hazardous. So 
is ever, so is every surface of, that you touch and the gloves that you touch. If you just touch the instruments and touch another surface, it's going to you're going to have contamination uh, transferred to that surface. Floors, splashes upon soles of feet, and your your uh, foot shoe coverings are, can carry those uh, contaminants to the outside of the uh, sterile processing. So I want you to stop for a minute and think about these particular contaminants. Virus counts are particularly uh, uh, are approximately in this in this slide per milliliter. That's a square cube. I'm sorry, cubic uh, centimeter. HIV, you have in that little cubic centimeter, you have about 10 to 10,000 viruses. Okay, uh, and that scientific notation, it's a one with one zero, or it's a one with four zeros. That's how fancy scientific notation is. So when you see that. Just add the zeros that it has up on the upper right. Uh, hepatitis C has about a million, I mean, sorry, a billion, I mean, sorry, a million uh, 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 per milliliter. But look at this, hepatitis B, 10,000, 10, 10 million, sorry, uh, to 10 to the third. Okay, I had to look it up. How much is that? That is 10 trillion viruses in that little tiny area. So it doesn't take much left left over, not quite reaching that area, not getting up every uh, part of it to still end up having infectious uh, organisms there. Uh, I know, you can see the dog. Uh, my brother was a healthcare worker who did acquire hepatitis C. He had his liver replaced. It's been over a million and a half to keep him alive. As in these are important things. Now, he was doing something uh, with EMS, and uh, unfortunately, that's where it happened there, not, not in sterile processing, but it's, it's something we need to be always cognizant of. This is just a list of different types of um, uh, organisms. And these arrows will show you those that have caused infections, and then you can see how long they stay alive on surfaces. And I've got another one here for the, the uh, yeasts and fungi, as well as for the viruses. And I'm going You realize that uh, I will have this so that you can have a PowerPoint of them. Not a PowerPoint, I, I actually meant to say a uh, PDF of them, six per page. But that way you've got something to be able to read and see how long these organisms, some of them uh, several hours, but many of them days, weeks, months, and something like norovirus, CDC doesn't even give a date because it is so stable in the environment. Okay, environmental cleaning, dedicated storage area. Don't let anybody else use it. They are not allowed to use it, not even on the, on the clean side or any other area. It, is, should, be, it should be latched uh, and with the signs on it uh, because it, it, they probably have items in there contaminated no matter how well you try and keep them clean. Uh, keep the storage closet interior contents dry because you don't want things multiplying in there. And spills in the contamination area clean up immediately. Horizontal surfaces should be cleaned and disinfected in beginning and end of each shift. Not day, but the, the shifts itself. So you may have three of them if you have three shifts. Floors and cleaned, disinfected every day. Note many of the disinfectants are inactivated by organics and cellulose, such as cotton paper and uh, wool. Recommended disposable synthetics head mops and uh, mop, mop heads and uh, biohazardous waste removed at frequent intervals. H housekeeping, all areas cleaned daily should be the same used by the operating or delivery rooms. Um, the floor should be cleaned and disinfected daily. Uh, the contamination area of microbial counts are high, requiring extra attention in each of these areas I have listed and how important it is to address them. Uh, always clean from a clean area into a dirty area. Keep focus and know what you're doing so that you're not bringing the dirty back up into the clean. Uh, make certain that the disinfectant stays wet for the and I'm going to repeat that. Make certain the disinfectant stays wet for the time required on the label. And remember that required time uh, when the auditor asks you about it. Uh, so that's important. You want to be able to say, oh, yeah, I have to keep it wet for 10 minutes or for two minutes um, so that he knows 
uh, that you know how long you need to be keep it wet for disinfection. Uh, the EPA and the CDC requirements are that you follow the label instructions. Uh, otherwise, there can be liability issues as well as just not being effective to the cleaning that's supposed to be doing. Uh, making sure that wet areas are dried before you start to, to clean them as, as much as possible. You must clean and remove any of the organic spilled blood and tissues and everything else that is organic must be removed before you use a disinfectant because the organics, proteins, and things like that, um, uh, they deactivate many of the disinfectants. Uh, disinfectants squirt delivery, measure it because it changes over time. And many have been caught uh, realizing that they're not using the right concentration. And the inspector will check that, should be checking that. Uh, the concentration is often too low. The pH may not be adjusted. Are you, are you testing your pH? Because sometimes it changes in your uh, uh, water. Um, municipal water. Expired, making sure that, that something like bleach, it's only, after you dilute it, it's only good for 24 hours. Uh, do you have that on the label? This label for the bleach, uh, the, it is a use uh, a level or um, diluted, and it's only, when did you make it and when is it expired? Uh, to make sure that we aren't using something that's no longer killing anything. Uh, and insufficient contact time on surfaces, as we noted. You, now, this is a big one that most people don't realize. Use of cellulose, whether it's paper, or cotton, or, um, or, or, or wool rags, decrease the effectiveness of many of the, surfact, uh, the uh, disinfectants. And that would include uh, sodium hypochlorites or bleach. It includes quats, quaternary ammonium uh, chlorides, and it includes um, hydrogen peroxide. Schultz, Schultz did a study, it reduced bleach disinfectant capability by 75% in 30 seconds. He just took the, uh, uh, a wipe and sprayed it uh, with the uh, bleach and uh, the diluted bleach. And you can see by the gold bars at the far right is the paper. In, in 30 seconds, it had lost its capability to, to, uh, of, um, uh, to disinfect its parts per million of um, active chlorine it, by that much. It's just amazing. And the different types of materials. Most are made of polypropylene um, that you find inside the uh, canisters. So uh, when you start to question it, because it feels almost feels like a oh, paper, um, it's either a straight polypropylene or a polypropylene with some um, a little bit of, of paper in it, not enough to, to cause an impact. Um, but those are important things to realize to make sure that you aren't defeating the purpose of your disinfection. This is another one where they started off with 500 parts per million of chlorine, and they did. They were able to kill 100,000 staph aureus. They changed it and put a cotton rag in a bucket of the disinfectant, and then they, uh, after an hour, they used the same time period with the same number of uh, staph aureus and found they could only kill 100. So it just makes a huge difference uh, when we start using the cellulose, which is means plant-based. Monitor your cleanliness. I highly recommend because it, sometimes you just don't realize you're not getting in that corner or you're you're missing a per certain item. And the, the supervisor or, or the manager of your area can go ahead and mark those or you can take turns in doing it yourself uh, to make sure that your colleague uh, or uh, your um, workers are using enough, getting the area, and if it's you still have a light fluorescence that you see there when you use the uh, correct black, black light with it, uh, they can't see it when they're cleaning. So they may not give enough elbow grease, they may not push hard enough and clean off that film. Um, so it's, it's a great way. And that's for cleaning. And then for disinfectants, whoops, sorry, my, my arrows, uh, for disinfectants, you can use something like the monitoring ATP and to make sure that that area has disinfected as well as cleaned. Um, but remember that with ATP, viruses are not allowed. So they're not going to show whether or not you've been able to disinfect those. And spores are hibernating. So things like if you've got a C. diff, C. difficile um, uh, it, 
problem in the area. The spores will be hibernating, so they really aren't going to show up as, oh, oops, you forgot to clean that area or didn't clean it well enough. Make, be sure you record all, do your internal audits and record them. And if something's wrong, like I say, go ahead and fix it, date it uh, when it's supposed to be fixed, fix it and, and sign off that it has been properly fixed. And it goes a long way to convincing your auditor that you're doing a great job. It goes a long way to making your patients safer. Uh, make sure that everything is kept dry, keep things dry, hang scrubs and brushes, do not refill hand soap and lotion containers because biofilms can go on the sides and uh, start to contaminate it over uh, reusing it and reusing it. Clean and disinfect de dead spaces, SPD excellence, ideal traits to have and foster in, op, in, in the sterile processing as well as in um, uh, decontam as well as in the operating room. A consistent dependability, cooperative attitude, learn teachability, detail-oriented, willingness to learn, change as needed, strong sense of honesty and ethics, good judgment and critical thinking, concerned with the safety of staff itself as well as patients and deeply with patients since they're so much more vulnerable. Uh, good judgment and critical thinking, concerned with safety, vigilant, ability to work independently and as a team, positive attitude, helping others learn, responsible, maintaining composure, a true professional. Be your best focused self, help your team members to be their best because you are healthcare professionals and because patients entrust their quality of life and life itself into your care. Thank you so much and be sure and get the handout so you can go ahead and review what everything I stumbled over. I appreciate it very much. Weva, thank you so much for this presentation. It's, it's such a pleasure to hear you speak every time. And like Weva said, everyone, uh, she will put together a PDF handout that will be available in the resources tool on the on-demand version of this presentation. I want to say a special thank you to all of you who chose to spend your day educating yourself. There's no instance where making that decision is the wrong one. So for your dedication to your professional development and patient safety, we sincerely thank you. Thank you to our sponsor 3M and our partner CCI. Um, for everyone who'll be, who will be viewing this program on demand, we are so glad that you're seeking out free education through Beyond Clean. You will automatically be redirected to the virtual events page on the Beyond Clean website where you can access the conference survey and download your CE certificate. We are thankful for you. We hope to see you again at the next Beyond Clean virtual event. And we have an action-packed rest of the year. So definitely connect with us on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram to learn more. And in the meantime, until next time, keep fighting dirty. Thanks, Lindsay.